Good morning, and thank you for joining us. I'm sitting here this morning with Martin Sorrell, who heads WPP, and John O'Keefe, who's the Worldwide Creative Director of WPP. And we're here for Ogilvy TV to ask a few questions about the success that the agency and the holding company has had over the course of this can and throughout the entire year. So there's been an interesting shift in acquisition strategy of late with Buzzy and full screen. Can you talk about the rep what this means to be moving more into the digital and outside of the advertising space? Um, well, it's not, it's not, to be honest with you, it's not, not new stuff, actually, mm -hmm. because it's just a continuation of a sort of three-pronged strategy. The first is to get our, if I, if I could be so bold as to say traditional businesses, uh, like JWT, like Ogilvy, like YNR, like Gray, I mean our traditional agencies, to move much more rapidly into the digital spaces. That's one element to it. The second is to get our, our Forrester digital leaders, we have four in the group out of seven uh, worldwide, nobody else has more than one, we have four. So to get a Wonderman, uh, to get an Ogle V1, to get a VML, to get an AKQA, to build their considerable digital uh, activities on a global basis, or even more on a global basis, because you're talking about Ogle V1, for example, and one of them being there are almost billion, well, billion, billion dollar businesses close to it in the case of Ogle V1, and one of them actually has cracked the billion dollar uh, barrier. And uh, obviously, VML and AKQA are smaller, but they're very, very strong in building their business uh, globally. And then the third strand is what I would call the WPP digital area, which Mark Reed looks after. So we're building possible there out of a number of acquisitions and organic growth. Uh, acquiring agencies like uh, Rockfish, uh, based in, in Bentonville, um, very strong digital agencies, and then making investments like in Buddy Media and Omniture, uh, which unfortunately got taken out by Adobe and Salesforce.com too early in my view, but provide tremendous knowledge and training vehicles for our people. Now in that, you, you mentioned Muzi in, in, in mobile which is the first investment of WPP Ventures. We tended to do mid-stage in that third strand. Mm -hmm. We tended to do mid-stage and late stage rather than early stage, true venture capital. What we're doing now using a Tom Betty Carrier's abilities and insights because he's based, he's, part, he's the chairman of AKQA, mm -hmm. HS's partner really, in AKQA. He's based in Silicon Valley. And we said, well, well let's take the opportunity of having our listening post in Silicon Valley. And, and Tom's first investment, our first choice is Mozi, which is a, a mobile a venture capital investment, very small, it's not a small amount of money, but interesting in terms of building mobile capability. So you'll see more early stage investments. And we're, 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 our view, I mean, some people think this is not the right thing to do, I happen to think it's obviously the, the right thing to do, is to start to make investments, not, uh, not purely for financial return, although that is an important part of it, but to get knowledge, get our people trained. I mean, Buddy Media was an excellent example, Omniture was an excellent example, because in the case of Web Analytics and Facebook, what we were doing was training our people, working with clients to use Facebook and to understand Web Analytics in a much more sophisticated way. Um, you brought up uh, WPP Digital, um, and this week was the conference for Stream. Yes. Um, can you tell us, you know, that's a different perspective on CAN than I think most people see. What, what do you see coming out of CAN on the basis of what you saw at Stream? Well, uh, you know, John, uh, we, we, John joined us, what is it, four years ago? Almost five. Almost five, perhaps. The, the time flies when you're enjoying yourself. <laughs> um, so, John, and his, I mean, John's brief was to, to raise the creative standards of WPP as a whole. I mean, obviously, Ogilvy is outstanding and has had an outstanding well had an outstanding year last year uh, here at can and and will I, I, I predict <laughs> have an outstanding year again here even more outstanding if, if it's possible to be even more outstanding uh, this year and uh, WPP had an outstanding year uh, last year and the year before because we we're, we're waiting for for John to do a Ronaldo hat trick or a hat trick that's even better than a Ronaldo hat trick and we'll see whether he manages it this evening, I'm sure he will. Um, so you heard it first on Ogilvy TV. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, it was to raise the creative standards. And I think, um, well, you, you speak for yourself, John, about what you, what you saw when you came into WPP and, and about general creative levels. Yeah, well, I'm glad I don't have uh, 
the complexity of Martin's job because I have a one-pronged strategy. Um, and as Martin said, uh, when I was first speaking to, to Martin, he said, we need a creative differentiator, I think was the phrase he used at the time. And it was quite daunting. Um, but the reason I took the job on is I didn't feel there was any sort of God-given right for any particular group to be in perpetuity just the more creative. I didn't think there was any rational reason on earth why any of our holding companies shouldn't punch their weight and indeed above their weight and be seen to be um, the best there is. And I was vindicated, I guess, uh, when in my first six months I made a point of visiting as many people and as many offices in as many parts of the world as I could. And I came away thinking, I've made the right decision. This was the right job to take. These are very, very good people. And I think they just needed uh, to be reminded of the fact, you know, you are very, very good. Don't worry about what the commentary of design was called. Keep telling you. There is no reason on earth why you shouldn't be number one in your field. And, you know, insofar as I've had any influence on them at all, um, that's kind of what I've done, but you know, I pay tribute to each and every one of them for what they've done, in particular Ogilvy. Ogilvy is a particularly interesting model because of the Miles and Kai leadership, joined at the hip, creative and suit, if you like, mm -hmm. if Miles will forgive me, um, at the very, very... Not a very good suit, actually. <laughs> very, very top of the company. Um, I was referring to the flannel and the cloth, not, not suit in the badminton suit. Very, very well dressed suit and a very, very capable suit as well. But they, their, their, their approach, when they did it in Asia and became the go to cool shop in almost every country in Asia, and then transferred to, the, to uh, New York, retaining the same model, which the two of them, they share the decisions. They, they live and breathe the creativity of the Ogilvy legend and, and they deliver. And, you know, I'd like to see that model replicated more across more of our opcos. Uh, WPP has just won the EFI Award as the most effective uh, holding company. Second year in a row. Second year in a row. What impact does a holding company have on the operating company's creative and effectiveness output? Well, you, you know, I think... Um, some people would say no, no whatsoever. <laughs> um, no, I do. I think it's it's um, it's it's more than a nice to have. I mean, we if if you don't win these things, people try and uh, say that they're not important. Right? So if you you come second or third, you get the silver or bronze medal. You say you know. Um, there was a time I think uh, actually before to be fair to John, I think before John got here, where we would say the same, but about five years ago, you know, we came to the view that this was very important. CAM was becoming very important. Well, this is, to, to my mind, and John and I discussed this, and I wrote this in campaign with, with John's help, um, that this was really, like, if you win a CAM, you know, whatever it is you win a CAM, it's like an Olympic gold medal, or, it's, it's a, or a World Cup, if you mm -hmm. uh, or a Formula One championship. Um, and I think, I think it's true. So I think, uh, and you could say the same thing about the FS. I and mean, there are two things. One is creativity, whatever that means, because it means a lot of different things to different people. And it's much broader today. I mean, media people could be creative, by the way. So can research people. So can even financial people be creative. So creativity comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. But it, then you can be creative and you can be effective. And the great thing about uh, the Effectiveness Award, uh, which Ogilvy was also uh, one of the agency, and Unilever, one as the client and Coca-Cola as the brand, so it was sort of a happy, uh, happy conference on the perfect storm or the perfect reverse storm. Um, so we won it for two years in a row. Uh, hopefully tonight we'll win uh, the 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 gong here for the third year in a row. And I think it has a very good atmospheric effect on the company as a whole. Uh, Ogilvy winning Network of the Year last year, and I hope they will do it again fairly sure they were, again, you heard the third prediction here, uh, for the first time on Ogilvy TV, um, you know, that has a very positive effect, obviously inside Ogilvy, but it also has a very positive effect on the rest of the group because it encourages other people 
you know, who are basically naturally competitive people, to want to do better. So you, you have a, a mutually reinforcing process. We mustn't get too arrogant about it, we mustn't get too cocky, and you know, the fact is that in a moment we get on the plane tomorrow, you know, have to start painting the bridge, uh, painting the ship again mm -hmm. uh, for next year. Um, somebody did suggest, you know, if we, we win here in camp three times, we should then retire and not, not, not <laughs> enter again, because entry fees are, uh, entry fees are pretty heavy. Uh, according to our calculations, entry fees alone to CAN this year will be about $30 million. So we are talking about, you know, that for everybody, not for us, but for everybody. Yeah. And um, that's, a, that's a big number. So it's becoming a little bit, um, in my mind, to my side, my, too frenetic uh, to some extent. But net-net, it's very good news for the group. It's very good news for Ogilvy and each of our networks, because all of our networks, I think, have done better this year than they did last year. And the actual number of potential points is pretty much the same. So we've increased our market share quite significantly. And uh, I think it's, it has a galvanizing effect and positive impact across the board. And to, to John's point about these, I did something with the Berlin School, uh, Creative School, yesterday, Michael Conrad's uh, school, and some, some people put their hand up and asked about you know, structures. And I you know, referenced what John said about uh, Miles uh, and Kai, and as he said, joined at the hip, you know, sharing an office. And so people quite clearly see that there's a union between the, the strategic planning and account management side of the, the agency and the creative side, and that there, it is a partnership, and there is a, a degree of equality. Uh, which, you know, in, in, in companies that are too led by, say, the, the suit side um, or too led even by the creative side, you know, there isn't a proper balance, and they can become naturally imbalanced. So I think it's really uh, interesting, and it's a great tribute to Miles, who's you know, been running Ogilvy for a few, only a few years, uh, to have actually sort of potted, taken what the skills he had in Asia with Kai, and then as John said, we potted it in you. John, there are several clients that WPP handles as a group, as opposed to on an individual agency basis. Mm -hmm. um, how does the creative dynamic work there? And um, do you, are you able to get a dynamic like the one that Miles and Kai have in shops like that? Frankly, not to as great an extent as I would like to see. It's something we're working on. Um, you know, as Miles says, we shouldn't label specific people creative as though others are entirely uncreative. You know, many of our businesses don't come to CAN, don't enter CAN because it's not relevant to their function, but they are among our more and most creative businesses. Um, that said, I would like to see within our teams, um, you know, toward the top of those teams, the, the Miles and Kai model. I mean, I could say the Jim Heakin, Tim Mellors model similarly because Gray, who started historically from a fairly low base, have seen in the last few years, I would say a revolution, you know, and again the commentariat's attitude takes a long time to shift, but, but Gray is now a very, very, very uh, good proposition for any client. And I think, you know, it's again testament to what, to what Martin's saying, what I say, if you get that, um, you know, the suit and the creative running it and get the balance right, again as Martin says, that's when you start to see the results. And it's no coincidence, just finally, to see the advertiser of the year at CAN, year in, year out, if you correlate that achievement, and it will be associated obviously with fantastic creative work, going back to was up mm -hmm. for Budweiser. You look at the business performances of those individual businesses in that specific year where they were advertiser of the year at Cannes, they will either have posted a record share price or record sales, or in some way there is some massive business achievement at the same time as brilliant creative. Creativity is the last unfair advantage in an otherwise very homogenous world. In the Cannes debate with yeah. uh, Mutarkant and Joe Tripodi, that um, the fast-growing markets, or actually rather, who can't mention it, uh, now include the United States due to demographic changes. Yeah. I was wondering if you could comment on that, because that was an interesting thing to hear. Well, it, it's interesting in the sense that what, what I was trying to get at there is, and, and Sol Trujillo, who's, who's 
of, of Hispanic origins um, and is on our board is, is, has this concept of the, the new mainstream. Mm -hmm. And the new mainstream is not just Hispanic community, it's the Afro-American community and it's the Asian-American community. And if you look at the demographics, uh, if you look at, I can't remember whether it's under eights or under tens, but, but the proportion of uh, people coming into that population, being born into that population, is now more than 50% of the total population. So this is the, the growth segment. And one uh, multi, uh, multinational FMCG company, uh, I know, said to, said to us that all their growth in the United States in the next 10 years is going to come from those new mainstream segments. Uh, now, it's not the growth at the levels that you would see in uh, Mexico or uh, Pakistan, or necessarily, but it is, it is the growth segment, or more of the growth segment, uh, in the United States. And so I think marketing, I mean, if we look at the weight of spending in those categories, those segments, is rather like uh, online, you know, we know we're, we're not spending enough. So the question is, how can you get uh, our clients to start understanding more the potential of these, these segments? So there is a, a growth, I mean, I think we underestimate the power of the American economy, I think because of 3D, things like 3D printing and 3D manufacturing and because of the shale gas reserves and America is going to be a much more powerful country than we think. I think it will be a G2 world dominated by the US and China um, for, for good or bad. But um, having said that, uh, I think there's tremendous opportunities there and I think it's just a question of trying to get clients to, to focus on that because we're focused very much on the BRICS and next level. Mm -hmm. We're focused very much on, on technology. We're, we are very focused on consumer insight, what I'm, I'm going to insist we call data investment management uh, in the future, and obviously on horizontality, which we touched on getting people to work more more closely together. But having said that, I think looking at these growth segments, and that, you know, the final point is sort of what, what we're starting to see a little bit of, I think, is a realization that although Western Europe is pretty depressed at the moment, you know, France, Italy, Spain. These are big economies. They're too big to fail. They're all two, two and a half, three trillion dollar economies individually. And these economies will at some point in time bounce back. America is the biggest one, 16 trillion. And they'll bounce back. And so we, we tend to forget that. And some of the activity you're starting to see in Western Europe is interesting. For example, in the telecom sector where people are clearly signaling, they think the valuations have got out of kilter. There, these companies are too cheap and undervalued, and we'll see. So there'll be a cyclical bounce at some point in time. Uh, whether there'll be the structural change that we need in Western Europe, uh, for example, here in France uh, or in Italy or Spain, uh, we'll we're yet to see. But uh, it, there's some signs that things are starting to improve. So all is not lost, and it does say in the Wall Street Journal this morning that uh, everybody at can is, is optimistic. I didn't quite detect the same degree of optimism as stated in the article, but it is good to be a little bit brighter. Excellent. And that's a wonderful note on which to end. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. Okay. Very good. Thanks, all. Thank you.